Welcome to this Lord's Day. He is risen. <laughs> you know, some of you guys who are you know, a, little, a little longer in the tooth might remember that our, our link letter had a show that was called, you know, I think the uh, Things Kids Say or something like that. Where it was always really funny that these kids would say things and you think about them going, well, that's actually pretty intuitive. And I was reading one this morning that was, uh, it was interesting that I guess the father and the daughter were having a conversation and, and, uh, and he says, well, you know, have a good day, because she's about to go off to school. And she said, well, you know, I'll try. And it, it, we just have to try to do the best we can to get to another day. <laughs> and, now that, you know, if, if she was high school, I would get it, but she was in pre-kindergarten. <laughs> so, you know, you may think, well, is pre-kindergarten living really that stressing? I don't remember being that bad. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we think about that, we think, you know, uh, that's kind of the attitude of the world. It's like we look out there and we have this attitude. It's like, you know, I hope we can make it through one more day. Just get one more day. Except our Lord tells us that that's not, that's not the quality that we're supposed to, you know, supposed to have. That's not the quality that we're supposed to have with it. We're always supposed to be looking and, 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 and looking for our Savior and enjoying the days that we have and using those days productively. That, that is the way we're supposed to be acting. So uh, not to pre-kindergarten. Even though much of the world now these days looks like pre kindergarten and the way people act, but uh, you know, we should be joyful in the, in, in the Lord. And we should be at peace in the Lord. Ephesians 6.11 says this. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now it says that because we need to put on armor because we're at war. Anybody don't think we're at war? Uh, absolutely, because I was going to have to talk to you after uh, class. But... <laughs> Every, in every good army, every good army, whether you know they have tactical successes or whether they have tactical failures, they have plans to do what is called regrouping. So if you get go into battle and, and, and you get you know you get stomped, you have already have a plan in your head where everybody's going to meet and you're gonna regroup and you're gonna make another plan and you're gonna go out. Or if you have a success, you know, and, and you defeat the enemy, you have a plan to come back and you regroup so that you don't just keep chasing and fall into a trap. This is how, you know, modern ancient armies work. This is how modern armies work. Everybody has a plan for your regrouping. I don't know if you guys are aware, but the regrouping spot, if you ever get a tsunami, is up the hill by the gas station. I've seen this already. <laughs> Any good school teacher, at times, especially before the final exam, is going to stop and have a review, right? It's just that's the way I remember from school. It's the way it always worked. Uh, this morning, before our prophecy post, I, I want to, uh, and, and before we continue peeling the onion of Luke chapter 15, I want to do just that. I want to regroup for a second, and I want to review a few things real quick for you guys this morning. Well, it's, I think it's, it's interesting and, and important for us to do that occasionally, just kind of stop Circle the wagons and okay, but where are we? What, what, what all is going on? So, I want to mention a couple of things this morning. All right, last week we talked a lot about the layers of the hood, talked about how that relates to God's word in a very descriptive way. That we should be looking at what is God is trying to tell us under the surface. We should always be looking at it. We spent quite a bit of time talking about that last week. We, we talked about how the same parables, three parables in, the, in uh, Luke chapter 15. And have meanings that address different audiences. Those not people that are listening all hear something different, even though they are hearing the exact same parable. They, those parables, because they are like that, because scripture is alive and active, can sound different. Um, they can sound different to each individual person that's there. They can sound completely different. One can think to another. One can sound like salvation, one can sound like discipleship. That with the eye, with the word being alive and active, that we, as Christians, no matter what maturity level we have, we can also pick up things from the scripture that we've never seen before. Same piece of, same piece of, uh, same passage of scripture that we've read 50 times, all of a sudden we think on a different meaning. Or we will find a companion verse somewhere else within the canon of scripture that all of a sudden reminds us and says, oh my goodness, I remember that being over here. 
And now that supports it in a, in a different way. And that's the reason we study. That's the reason that we look at God's Word and keep reading and keep studying and keep talking about it and having Bible studies and trying to dig deeper and peel closer and closer to that core of the end. So I want to be a good teacher this morning, and I want to review this a little bit from last week. It's intense, a lot of information there, and, and you know, a few people asked after it, but asked the question. And um, what I want to do is, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about something else. I want to just for a second talk about the parable of the sower. Okay. In this world, there are four types of people. Four types of people that are talked to us about, and, and they're going to compare the soils in the parable of the sower. Everybody know the parable of the sower? Okay, we'll talk all enough about it, so even if you're not aware of it, if you don't understand it. Uh, Romans chapter 1 assures us that there's not one person ever, right now, or ever has been one person anywhere that has been born on this planet that has any excuse before a holy God when, when the judgment comes. Nobody. He has made himself known to every single solitary man. So I want you to keep that in mind as we start talking a little bit about the parable of the sower. Um, Four types of soils. Last week we talked about four kinds of people. We talked about tax collectors and sinners, and we talked about Pharisees and scribes. Now remember that these were the people that were there when Jesus gave his three parables in Luke chapter 15. Um, just like us, just like today, there were people in the crowd that no matter what Jesus said, they didn't hear it. They did not have ears to hear it. And even though they heard it, it didn't penetrate at all. It was just like the soil where the seed falls on the path and the birds come and snatch it away. That's the parable. The parable means that people hear these words. They hear the word of God. They hear from God and they see God in his creation. And Satan comes and takes that idea right over their head. And they are never able ever to have an understanding of who Jesus is or what God has done for them. Many of the scribes and Pharisees, even though they knew God's work by heart, okay, you get to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Can you imagine? But they knew by heart, and yet they never heard it. They never listened to anything that it said. In fact, they did the exact opposite of what all of that scripture, all of those passages that they would have begun to memorize it as a very young child, never one time did it ever penetrate. They didn't really hear it. For them, it was all political. Then we got a seed that falls on you know, a rocky path or, or, or among the rocks, and quickly it springs up, and yet the sun takes it, cooks it, messes with it. We know that there were Pharisees and the like, and scribes and the like that were there, and probably even tax collectors and sinners who you know, might have went, oh, this is great, and yet, because they didn't continue to study, they didn't continue to look into God's Word and grow deeper, which is what we want to do, that sooner or later, they had no root. So it's like, eh, the shoe doesn't fit, and they moved on. They no longer ever thought about Jesus and his message. We had those people that drew near to him to hear. Now remember, the tax collectors and the sinners, they were drawing near to him to hear, and he was eating with them, which was crazy in the day. We'll talk about that in a second. And they would gladly receive God's word. But like I said, we had those who had several types. Several types. I mean, the first type, you know, they got a one-way ticket south. The other three types, you know, they receive Christ, and there is growth for a period of time. It does take place, but they never cultivate it. Some never cultivate it. And or then, when, temp when temptation came, they fell away. Then there were others that, you know, they sprung up. It was great, and yet the, the cares of the world, other things, got into what they normally do. I don't have time to read today. Uh, you know. It was a really cool Netflix program starting. You know, a new show. It's, it's, it's 
like the next season. So I don't come to read today because, you know, Netflix. Or it could be anything. It appears the world just having a hard time. You know, sometimes life is tough. Sometimes things happen that take our attention away from God. And, and that's planned. That's planned. That's Satan's strategy. He gets you to look at and focus on the bad things. So I don't have time to read that today because, you know, I'm, I'm knee deep in this stuff. Does it work? And then, of course, we have the, the last group that they receive it gladly. Boy, they just, you know, that's that's their passion. That becomes their life, and they show through, you know, 30, 60, 100 times more. It's not a lot of people. Most people are in the other groups. And we see that even throughout Jesus' ministry. And you have the Lord of all of the earth coming to coming to the earth and spending three and a half years preaching and doing unbelievable miracles. Unbelievable miracles in front of everybody. John in his gospel tells us that not all the books in the world were containing the things that Jesus did. So we just have to, this is just a brush stroke. In, in the, in, in, when we talk about the painting, this is just a brush stroke. And yet, how many people were left in the upper room after Jesus was crucified. We know that there were multitudes being fed. We know that there were multitudes that followed him around, that he had to flee, that he had to leave and go across the, the, you know, the, the Sea of Galilee to the other side, and they ran around and fed him. Multitudes of 120. 120. So we know that that's not the preponderance of people. So Jesus' words in Luke 15, they spoke to everybody in the crowd. There was an example for every type of individual, both to lead them to become rich soil that bears much fruit, or to bring them into that possibility in the first place. He had a message for every single person in these three parables. And the message for them, just like it is for everybody in this room this morning, is custom made just for you. It's custom made just for you. You will see your type. You will see your position. You will see your maturity written throughout the pages of the Bible. For you to be able to go, yeah, that's me. I mean, are there things that you have read that you go, oh, man, that just, that resembles with me? That's because that was written specifically for you. That's why we call the word alive and active. That's why it is alive. So we, we talked last week about the purpose of why Jesus ate with the low life, the, you know, the tax collectors and the sinners. This was, a, this was a terrible thing. And I'm going to show you why the Pharisees and the scribes thought that here in just a second. Yeah, he, he, he ate with these tax collectors and he ate with these sinners. And, 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 and the Pharisees used scripture, misinterpreted. They used it incorrectly to give them a reason why they should, shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. And so we must also be able to tell ourselves that when we read Scripture, we allow Scripture to discern Scripture, and we allow the Holy Spirit to discern. It's just not Jeff's idea. It's just not Jeff's idea that Psalms 83 is talking about future war. It's, it's backed up in Scripture to let us know what is taking place. It's not just one, one group of verses, and, and I just go, yeah, that hasn't happened yet. I have other proofs. I have other verses that support exactly what we're talking about here. So let's take a look at what the Pharisees might have thought was a good reason. It comes from Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So is this verse saying you separate yourself one physically from the low lives? the life, the tax collectors, and the sinners. It's saying separate yourself from those people. Because that's what the Pharisees would have read. That is what the scribes would have described the law to. Don't, don't walk with these people. Don't stand with these people. Do not sit with these people. They're bad people. Well, it couldn't be a command. 
We can't look at it that way because Jesus didn't follow it. Can't be a command like they're seeing it as. No, don't do this. It's got to be something else. So for us, you know, like I said, lucky we live what we live. You know, we can look back and say, well, you know, we, we know Jesus was perfect. The Bible tells us he was perfect. We have a piece of scripture here that looks like it's telling us not to mess with the world and people. Don't do it. Is that really what it's saying? No, because Jesus did not do it. I've highlighted three words on the word for you. There's something interesting about these words. Everybody know that Psalms is poetry, right? Psalms is poetry. In the, in the fashion that the Psalms were written, written, they often did things within them that had a hidden, hidden meaning that people back then who spoke the original Hebrew would have understood. These three words have a very interesting meaning if you reverse them. What do you do as a baby? What's the very first thing you do? You sit up. Oh, look at Junior. He's being beautiful. Look, he's sitting up. That's awesome. What do you do next? If you have, anybody ever have a kid where it's like, <laughs> yeah. Looks like he's on the roundabout. Yeah. yeah, they stay in. Remember? Yeah, you guys are thinking back. I see the pictures. Yeah. I'm telling you, that's that's the next. And then what do you do? What do they do after that? I mean, and this happens in a heartbeat. It's like they start walking, and now he's 42. Right? It's, it's exactly what happens. But this is in reverse order. Because if we do these things, if we live a life, that is immersed in these things, we will see the maturity that we have in the understanding of the knowledge of God's word going exactly the opposite order. We will go from being mature people that are able to walk to way less mature people that are only able to sit or to stand, and then less, even so, harder those that are able to sit. It's a reverse order. It's, a, it's an ascending thing. But this isn't saying stay away from these people. Because the rest of Psalms chapter 1 lets us know. Okay? Sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf will not wither. And whatever he does will prosper. In the law of the Lord. Should be reaching the lost. Not avoiding them. Not going a different direction. Not, you know, I mean, no, you don't immerse yourself in the same sin, but we should be talking to those people. We should be wanting to reach those people. We should be always, you know, just like I talked about, the kindergartner was like freaking out about going to school. Oh, I'll we'll make it for another day. That shouldn't be our attitude. People should wonder why in the heck. Is Jim so happy? Why did that? That man's crazy happy. Well, that's the way people should think about us. Paul is over there smiling. She's got this huge. What is wrong with her? Do you know how long she had to drive me to church today? <laughs> Listen, our actions speak volumes. But for sinners, don't read the Bible, they read Christians. We should be, if we delight in the word of God, if we delight in the law of the Lord, that should be, that should be even how we shine. It should be the way we look. It should be the way we smell. You know, there's a scripture that tells us you stink in a really good way. But there will be those that will, you know, they'll smell it on you. Some will be interested. Some will be repulsed. But that's okay. We don't know the difference. We don't know which one's real and which one's real. Tell you that uh, breaking bread with the likes of those that Jesus broke bread with is not just allowable, it's God. It's God. You just don't become entrenched in the things that they're entrenched in. You are the, you know, you ever seen that childhood thing where it's easier to pull somebody down off a chair than it is to pull somebody onto a chair? I mean, try it sometime. See if it's easier to pull someone off a chair than pull somebody up on a chair. What we have to remember is that's only correct if we're not Arnold Schwarzenegger on the chair lifting up Pee Wee Herman. Then it's easier. Okay? And that's the way we should look at it. So yes, we are dragging people to our level, not allowing them to drag us. Because we know this about God. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Says the Lord God but rather that he should turn from his ways and live. 
you know, we're up to God. If he gives us free will, we're up to God. Every single person on this planet will be saved. I know people talk about, you know, limited atonement and all the tools and things. Uh, but it's trusting. If God, if, if it was allowable, if we all would do it, it would be the biggest party heaven ever had. But that's, he gives us free will, and people make really bad choices, especially for eternity. God doesn't want anybody to perish. And it was the Pharisees' job then, and the believer's job now, that we tell the ones that have ears. We tell the ones that have ears. And that's the whole reason that God breathed his word in the first place. It, it, you know, it, so we can share it. Okay? We share pictures all the time. We even share apps. Selfies? Man, it's hard to do that. It's hard to share that. Let's see. I'm not good at it. You know, I'll let the pastor do it. Or, you know, I know so and so does a really good job. I'll let them do it. But listen, we're not in every circle. That person's not in every circle. We have our own circles. And our circles are our circle. And those people within your circle are the people that God wants you to influence. He's not going to lose anybody. He promises this to that. But man, what a great, what a great story we get before the beam of seed. And you know, God says, well done, good space and so And you got all that stuff that didn't burn up behind you. And I know there won't be any pride there, but I can just see some of the people that I know. <laughs> yeah, look at me. I, I, I did good. I pleased my Lord, and that's the important thing. He's given us this message from the very beginning. It's a message of hope. It's a message of salvation. It's a message of righteousness. That's where it gives us layers of understanding. That's what Luke chapter 15 is all about. It's all the way, everything within there. It's all the way from the very lost person who's never heard the spoken word about Jesus all the way to glory, all the way to us when we get glorified and we change this meat suit that is terribly flawed for a brand new model that has none, that has no fault. All the way from lost to glory. That is what our word talks to us about. Jesus spoke to people in parables and in regular conversations according to their class. He speaks to us that way today. So I'm going to compare just really quickly two different events. Just to clarify that that's what takes place within Luke chapter 15 today. So the first one, uh, we know who Nicodemus was, right? He was a, he was a Pharisee. Uh, this takes place in John chapter 3. This is it. Nicodemus comes uh, to me, curious. What's going on? Well, who is this guy? So Nicodemus comes. Well, let's read it. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, what is Rabbi mean? Teacher, right. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. By the way, what you see here, can you figure out what class of person that he is? What class was he in? What soil was he in? Which one's he most like? We're not sure exactly about the conversation that goes on here. But we know from later that Nicodemus turned out to be a really good guy. Whether, whether he believed a little bit, was just afraid to show, that's why he came by night and, you know, like, ah, you know, we know you're a teacher. Could you, could it be the Messiah? Could you be the Messiah? We know that later on, he was the, he was the guy that Joseph of Arimathea that went and asked Pilate for Jesus' body and took Jesus' body and anointed him and put him in a tomb, anointed him with very costly aloes and perfumes. So we don't know how he was approaching Jesus exactly. But the end of would have understood Jesus as far, even though he was like, how can it be? How can I go back into my mother's womb? He should have known. He should have understood exactly what Jesus was saying. By the end of the conversation, we know that had he not, was he not a believer when he approached Jesus in the first place? He sure was when he got it. 
when he finally understood exactly what Jesus was saying because we saw proof in the pudding. Jesus spoke to him exactly the way he needed for Jesus to speak to him, to change his life, to turn the way that he approached everything to put him over him. John gives us a, a, a very different approach. This passage, this next one, this is about Jesus meeting with the woman at the well, the Samaritan. We're going to read that in a second, but I want to say a few things. That uh, in ancient Israel, there were three ways that you could get from Judea to Galilee, places that Jesus spoke. Three different ways. One of them was a direct route, which went, went right through Samaria. Jews didn't go that way. They didn't go that way. They didn't like it. They were afraid of it. They were afraid of Jews who didn't like Samaritans. They didn't associate with Samaritans. They were being married just like the Pharisees because they believed the Samaritans were a polluted, corrupted people. They didn't like them. They were afraid of them. They would never go the central route, which is the most direct. They would either go all the way around, across the Jordan River, up through and over, or they would go all the way to the sea coast and go up the sea coast and back over to Galilee which always added about two days to the journey. It was a three-day journey anyway. Jesus didn't do that. He took the direct route. He took the shortcut to meet this one. Very, very important reason. Let's look at the conversation. And I'm cutting out, you know, everybody, know, everybody should know the story. I cut out a little bit of it just to keep the, the perfect. A woman of Samaria came there to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the sick country and say it like that. <laughs> I, I can't see Jesus, but get it right. Um, anyway, <laughs> for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, and this a little later in the conversation, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, how plain is that? So much different from the way he spoke to Nicodemus. Nicodemus had his type, he had an understanding, he would have known all the scriptures. He could have thought those things through his head. He could have figured out exactly what Jesus was trying to tell him from his station. This woman, other than the fact that, you know, she says that her, you know, her family, heritage, whatever, has worshipped the Lord on this mountain, she doesn't have a clue. And Jesus knew she didn't have a clue. And we know that his direct shortcut to this woman to be at the well exactly when she was there so that this entire town, or almost this entire town in Samaria, ended up coming to a saving knowledge of the gospel message. And everything that he said to all of us townspeople would have been exactly what he needed to say, so that they would have come to the same conclusion. He answered them, he said, look, the fields are ripe, the harvest is white. People need to hear the message. Don't get it done. Go harvest. And we know that you know, when he went in there, many, many people were saying, when you're that day. What we need to do when we look and we read God's word, we read things like Luke chapter 15, what we have to always do is say, what in the world? Who, where am I in this story? Who am I in this story? What level am I on in this story? And what is God trying to speak to me directly? You know, that, that doesn't tell you anything. Usually the next thing out of her senses is like, I don't believe it. I don't believe any of it. We have to read it and reread it and reread it and wait for that onion to start peeling back. Or, or we look at a lotus flower and we not there should be neat things inside of it. That's exactly the way God's work is. And we look at it and we say, okay, what's God saying? Which type of soil am I? Where's God leading me? Where do I need to begin? Do I change the direction of my life because of what this is telling you, like what Luke 15 is telling me? 
Or do I just keep going? You know, I'm doing okay. But word of that's not any ordinary story. And this is not reading that Charles holds. It's not an ordinary story. It never will be an ordinary story. We will never, ever, ever, as long as we live, no matter how much we study, ever even scratch the surface of the truth that is in this book. It's not even possible. You won't have that kind of understanding. And you don't get it. You don't spend an entire eternity trying to understand the character of God. And there'll be new revelations every morning. It's, it's amazing when we really start spending time with it. But it requires more than a surface reading. Okay, we'll read through it. We're going to now we're going to go on to the next level. We've reviewed. We're going to go to the next level now in the parables in, in Luke chapter, uh, you know, chapter 15. I, I, find, I find this layer uh, pretty interesting. Um, anybody... I cannot talk about, I've never called them this. Anybody know what the tenses of salvation are? Tenses. There's justification happened. There's sanctification happening. And there's glorification will happen. That's past, present, future. But the tenses of salvation. I've talked about justification, sanctification, glorification a lot. I've talked about it this way. And, and we can find it, I, I hopefully you'll find it as interesting. So let's go back and look at a couple of statements from our three parables in Luke chapter 15. Likewise, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous men who need no repentance. There will be. By the way, this is the this is the party part at the end of each one of the uh, in each one of the uh, in the parables, okay? Likewise, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is a present tense. But it was fitting to be merry and be glad for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He is lost and he is found. Now, I saw some smiles, so some, I think everybody may have picked up on the yellow highlighted words that these are tenses. <laughs> they are tenses, and uh, you know, I'm getting a smile on my face, so I think it's cool. I just think it's the coolest thing, you know. So you'll probably remember this verse. We talked about this verse last week, too. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. This verse makes us aware that there's a progression to our salvation. It's just like I talked about justification, sanctification, glorification, a progression in salvation. One salvation, three parts, three progressions, three tenses for us to take a look at. Justification, no longer lost. Luke chapter 15 talks a lot about lost things, does it not? Justification means you're not lost. Been saved. You're no longer lost. You're not out there in the wilderness by yourself. You are not somewhere on a dirty floor anywhere by yourself. You are not thinking about eating corn husks in a pigsty anymore by yourself. You are no longer lost. Sanctification is the growing and remaining ready for the Savior, the waiting period. But growing, not just, I use this all the time, not just sitting on the park bench waiting on the bus. This is not. Sanctification. It doesn't work that way. We are supposed to be growing in our faith at all times. And then we have glorification. That's being changed. We talked about that a little earlier. Trading in the old deep suit on a new, you know, a new nice one, you know, skinny tie, a whole nine yards. It's going to be wonderful. I can't wait. I'm very much looking forward to it. So what does Luke chapter 15 have to do with all that? Thank you. Okay. This is most famous verse in the entire Bible that talks about justification. Okay. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one should boast. We are saved by God's grace. That's it. Justified by God's grace. Well, we take a look here. But it was fitting to be married and be glad, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he has failed. What is God doing in that parable? When we talked about it last week, is he, 
He's sitting there waiting. He is looking every day, watching for the sun. Why is he sitting there watching for the sun? Because he already knows he's coming back. He's already predestined him into salvation. He already knows that he is going to be justified. He's just waiting for the son to get tired of the lifestyle that he's been living and turn and come back to the family. He is sitting there waiting for him to come back. He knows the son is coming. The son is coming was predestined way back in the Trinity past, just like everybody in here who is in the faith of Jesus Christ. Yours was done in the Trinity past. Your father was standing there waiting for you, looking down the road. You remember your conversion? The day that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, God was waiting. And saw you coming down the road, and he ran to you. He ran to you. That moment came, he ran, he returned the prodigal son's status, he gave him his sonship back, elevated him back to the family title, gave him a beautiful robe, put sandals on his feet, which meant, you know, in the day, that he was no longer a slave. He put a signet ring on his finger. Do you have a signet ring? You sure do. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That's your signet ring. That is your proof of sonship. God gave that back to you when he ran to you and justified you. And there was a party. Okay, so let's look at our next little step here. By the way, we're waiting in reverse order. For those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Present tense, saved. For by one offering, he has forever perfected those who are being sanctified. Present tense, you are being sanctified. Go back to our Luke chapter 15. Likewise, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Remember we talked about that coin last week that it's a part of the set? And it was a part of the set that was given to a bride at the betrothal. She would have worn it around her head. And she would have kept that. It would have been very, very important. The reason that she searched so hard for that one lost coin, not just because it was a bloody coin, but because it completed the set. It made, made certain that she was ready for the bridegroom to come. But she was keeping herself the way that she was supposed to keep herself. Just like we have a, 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 a responsibility to remain loyal and to continue to work out our salvation in fear and trembling before the Lord so that we can present ourselves as part of the bride, which is the church. We can present our own selves as spotless and blameless as possible. Even though Jesus does the work, we have to let him do the work. We have to move in that and try to get there. Ephesians 5.7, speaking of Jesus, says this, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not in spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. Jesus does the work for our benefit. Likewise, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous men who need no repentance. But our citizenship is in heaven, from where also we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our body in humiliation so that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working of his power, even to subdue all things to himself. Think about the story of the shepherd. He's out looking for the lost sheep. What does he do when he finds the lost sheep? He puts the lost sheep over his shoulders and carries him home. Just like Jesus. Carry us home. Glorify us. It's been eternity. The Word of God is alive. Sharper than the UGA show. If you remain a prodigal son this morning, return the fire. Like he's waiting for you to return. For those in the middle, us that are being sanctified, keep working. 
Keep working out your salvation with fear and trembling until the bridegroom comes back for his church, or until you are absent from the body and present with the Lord. And how do we do that? Well, this is a Bible church, right? Oops, what do you mean? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. God's word is so full of knowledge and information. And it speaks directly to each person in this room this morning. On a personal level, custom designed for each one of us to be able to understand and to take it forward. These are our own statement words. This is Jesus Christ speaking. The word of God helps to sanctify us as we walk in our faith. So if you're still a prodigal son, get it fixed. Not, not a hard thing to do. But as we continue to be sanctified and we continue to walk that out, this this is how that works. This is how we understand and take the next step. You'll read the directions on how to put the bike together at Christmas. The bike ends up looking like something it's not supposed to look like. But we need to make sure we have the directions at our fingertips on the cover that we use. But to walk out our faith, or walk into our faith, and to walk out our faith. God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today. Lord, I thank you for your word. It speaks volumes. It is a big idea. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that we can continue to find things, Father. I, I just, I, you know, I'm always amazed when I hear people say that the Bible is boring. Father, it's always anything but boring. There's so many unbelievable things that for us to find. Lord, help us to continue to find them. And to discern your truth through your Holy Spirit. Thank you for each person that's here today, Father. Lord God, help to take this nugget of your information and just build it in your lives, Father. Thank you for everything. We love you. We are earnest to live in Jesus, God. In Jesus' precious name.